we have covered so far two of the three main technologies that live on web pages. And they are HTML and CSS. These each serve a role in presenting a web page to a user. HTML is where the content lives. All right, by content I mean the text, the links, the images, the other multimedia. In HTML you also define the structure of the page. And what I mean by the structure is you separate the page into sections. And we talked about those tags um, special in HTML5 that allow you to do that. The head, the, or actually not the head, but the header, the nav, the sections, the asides, the articles, the footers. Those allow you to sort of break the page down into sections. So you can structure it. And that's important for a number of reasons. Um, it helps the user organize the, the, the information on the page and uh, helps them understand the page and how it's laid out so that they can become accustomed to it and use it more easily. CSS then is responsible for all things relating to the physical appearance of the page, including the layout. Um, and those two complement each other. The content has an appearance and you can choose to emphasize or de-emphasize certain content by changing its appearance. You know, more important stuff you have bigger than less important stuff. More important stuff you lay out towards the top of the page as opposed to the bottom of the page. Um, you may you may, have, you may have divided your page into a nav section that's structuring the page, but you choose to lay that out along the top of the page or along the left side of the page or the right side of the page, and that's the physical layout. So these things work together to provide uh, pages um, like the ones that we've done so far. Um, and the two work together. Again, um, the CSS being used judiciously will highlight and will, will properly emphasize and will present the content in the most appropriate, best way for the user to, to understand it and to get uh, what they need out of, out of the content. The last piece of this in web standards is JavaScript. And JavaScript, if I was going to describe it in a couple of words, I would say behavior and interactivity. And I would put sort of a, a catch to that, uh, interactivity within a single web page. I mean, you could call clicking on a link interactivity, right? Because you click on a link, a different page loads. I suppose that's some form of interactivity. But with JavaScript, we're talking about interactivity within a single web page. You do something and you don't leave that web page but something about the web page changes. And that's what we'll define as interactivity, where you do something and the page responds to it one way or another. Um, you can see a lot of examples of these if, if you go around, and, and we'll cover some uh, of them. And uh, once you sort of learn the basic idea, it's one of those things like, uh, in a way that's sort of like chess, where chess, there's a handful of pieces, they move a certain way, there's a handful of rules, but yet chess is a very complicated game. Why? Because you can piece stuff together in so many different ways. JavaScript is similar to that. We're going to learn sort of the basic formula for JavaScript, how JavaScript works most of the time, um, and we're going to learn to do some pretty simplistic, straightforward things to do. Uh, and then from that, you can see how you can extend that and take that to do very complicated things in JavaScript. Um, let's see. Let's pull up a few examples of JavaScript. All 
All right, notice this is an example of JavaScript. Notice the menus on LC's homepage. All right. And here we're going to have interactivity. And what do I mean by interactivity? The user sort of initiates an action, and the page responds somehow to it. That's generally what we mean by interactivity. And again, a, a, a sort of a synonym for that that you sometimes hear is behavior. In other words, the page just doesn't sit there. The page does something. All right, so if I put the mouse over student resources, I get a little submenu there of academic resources, career services, paying for college, and so on down the line. Likewise, if I put my mouse over that one, well, first of all, this one disappeared, and then this one appears. So I can go back between these. This is sort of a classic usage of JavaScript. Think about if you didn't do this with JavaScript. If you didn't do this with JavaScript, you'd really have a dilemma, right? You could, if there was no such thing as JavaScript, for example, you'd either have to always show all of these links, which would take up a lot of space, or you wouldn't show any of the links and you'd only get to the links when you clicked on the main link. So if there was no such thing as JavaScript, that would sort of affect the navigation of this page. This allows you, in a, without taking up a lot of space, to put a lot of links on the page. All right. Another very popular um, thing that has been done with JavaScript is, and this sort of goes along with mobile devices, and this notice, we only get this when the page is a certain size. Notice that when the page is wider, we get the menu on the top. When the page gets smaller, though, the menu disappears. And it's replaced by this little three lines. This is becoming very, very popular on, on um, mobile websites because it sort of uh, echoes what goes on in a lot of applications. And if we click on this, then boom, the navigation appears. And notice what happened. The image changed to go the other way. And you can click it to hide it again. So this is another way, and if you could imagine this on a mobile device, it's another way to sort of make the most of space on the page. All right? Especially in a mobile device, space is limited, so why show the navigation all the time? All right? Show it only when you want to see it. And the user can initiate when they want to see it by clicking on that icon, and then they can make it disappear again by clicking it again. Both of these things are fairly common devices, which is good. Um, one thing about web development that I don't think I've mentioned so far is, is, while it's good to be unique and original, it's also good to sort of follow practices that other people follow. That way, you know, people are used to seeing drop-down menus like this, and people are used to seeing the little icon to click on to, to pull down the menu. So if you do that, that can sort of increase the understanding of your page right off the bat. Now, both of these examples are essentially doing the same thing. They're hiding something, and then they're showing it when the user does something. Now, in this case, what the user does is puts their mouse over the, the link. When they put the mouse over the link, the submenu appears. When they take their mouse off the link, the submenu disappears. Link appears, link disappears. In this example, when you click on it, the menu, the, the, a full set of menu appears. And when you click off of it, uh, or when you click on it a second time, then the menu disappears. Both of these are a very similar sort of code behind it. And so what I want to do is I want to do something like this. And I want to do a simplified version of it first, for our first shot. And then I will, um, then I will, uh, we'll, we'll build up to do something a little more involved, something like those menus. But our first example, I want to be simple. Let's notice all the things that, that come into place with this.
there is first of all a user action that gets the ball rolling. So the user does something. All right. In terms of web pages, that's called an event. An event happens. All right. And the event can be any sort of typical way that the user interacts with the page. Moving their mouse on the page. Clicking on something. Typing something. Pressing a key. Pressing the right mouse button. Uh, all these things constitute events. And all these things are ways that the user can interact with the page. Most of them are just that. There are some other events that happen sort of without the user, like there's a page load event that happens the instant the page finishes loading from the server. So number one, there's an event that gets the ball rolling. Number two, there's a specific thing on the page that is going to be changed. All right? And in the code, we point to that thing on the page. So there's an event that gets the ball rolling. We point to something on the page that we want to change, and then we change one of its properties. All right, that's sort of the recipe for basic JavaScript. An event gets the ball rolling, and usually that event means the user's doing something. we point to the thing that we want to change. We'll talk about how we do that in JavaScript. Then finally, we change some properties of the page or take some other action. What do I mean by changing the properties of the page? When you hear the word property, you can think characteristic. So, in this case, in this example, when this page loads, all of those submenus load as well. But they're made invisible. All right. However, when we put our mouse on one of these items, we make those visible. So that menu is actually always there. We just don't see it. It's invisible. However, we change the property of it. And what do I mean by property? I mean the characteristics of it. Now, when we were talking about mobile development, we talked about how you can make something invisible. All right? Because we made the images invisible in our mobile design as opposed to our desktop design. We did that via what was called the display property. And we used to can set the display property to block, to inline, to a few other things. But one of the things we can set the display property to is none. If I set the display property to none, that makes it invisible. That means it doesn't appear. So I can point to the thing I want to change. I want to change that submenu, and what do I want to do? I want to change its display property from none to something else. Now keep in mind when I talk about these properties, these are properties that exist in HTML, and these are properties that exist on, in CSS. We've already seen these properties. These are nothing new. And we've changed these properties. We've changed, for example, the background color of a page. Right? The properties that we use in CSS and HTML, we've set the, um, we've set the uh, target of a link to open up Google or Yahoo or whatever. We've set the background color of a page. We've set whether, the, whether something is visible or not, and so on. All these things we've set through our HTML and CSS. Now we're going to change them from their initial value through some JavaScript code. All right? So, these things relate to what are called events. And we'll talk about some of the more common events, and we'll look at some of the more uncommon events. All right? 
These are things that we can put on HTML that trigger actions to happen. The ability to point to something on the page that we want to change is what is called the DOM. And DOM stands for Document Object Model. It's a language all of its own that allows us to refer to specific pieces of the page. And then finally, to be able to change those properties, we have the JavaScript language itself. So let's set up a very simple page to show, an, to show a spoiler. How many of you have seen the Star Wars movies? How many of you would know who Luke Skywalker's father is? Okay, do, do you? Okay, all right, I don't want to be a real spoiler for anyone. So if you're watching out in video land and you don't know who Darth Vader's father, oops, Luke Skywalker's <laughs> father is, you might want to like watch all six movies, come back and watch the rest of the lecture. Of course, I already spoiled it, all right? So let's set up a page that, that uh, has, um, that, that allows us to put a, a spoiler. If they don't know by now, exactly. This isn't like a Game of Thrones spoiler from earlier this week or something. Yeah, right, exactly. Let's create a new HTML page. And I want to look at how the pieces of the three languages that we study work together. And then we'll put it, put it all together to be sort of the dynamic way that we want it to be. Dynamic is also a word that's used sometimes with web pages, and dynamic simply means changing. So we're going to have a couple paragraphs here, and it's like, we find out who Luke Skywalker's father is. And I'm first going to do the HTML to this. Now with the HTML, remember, it's all content. It's no appearance and no interactivity. It is Yoda. I'm hoping you just didn't think that was funny and, and, and we're paying attention to it. All right, so now let's look at this page up on now remember, this is no CSS, all HTML. So we see So we see a statement and a spoiler underneath it. All right.
Now, I want to hide that. How do we hide it? We can set a star rule to say display is none. All right. And again, I'm going to put the style CSS as part of this page just so that I can work with everything in one concise file. Do I want to do this style rule, though? P display none. No. Why don't I want to do that? style rule. I have two paragraphs and I don't want to hide them both. All right. Um, okay. So what's our other alternatives? I could give one an ID. What's the third alternative uh, or another alternative? I could give them all a class. All right. Now, how do you decide what you're going to do? This is what I would ask myself. Am I likely to have more than one thing on the page that I want to hide? More than one thing on the page that's a spoiler? Yeah, maybe I do. I might have several spoilers. I might have that um, Princess Leia and Chewbacca are brothers and sisters, for example. All right, And so on down the line. So I may have more than one spoiler. So therefore, because I might have more than one, I'm going to use a class instead of an ID. You're absolutely right. I could have created an ID for it and used the ID to set the style rule to hide it. Um, I gain a little bit of benefit, though, by setting a class because there are several things I want to do um, to this. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to set a class of spoiler. And I'm going to put a class of spoiler on this. So now I look at the page, and it's gone. All right? So, yay. But there's no JavaScript on the page, so there's no interactivity. So I can't get that to appear. So this is a piece where JavaScript is going to come in. All right. And we could do this several ways. We could do this so that if they put their mouse over this, it would show the spoiler. Or I want to put a button. Now, we talked about submit buttons when we talked about forms. And we said a submit button had a job of sending uh, the data to the server to be processed. An important thing about JavaScript is all these things happen on the page without having to go back to the server. And that's really the big win of JavaScript. We can write this code to make small little tweaks to the page without bothering the web server. Now, what's wrong with bothering the web server? Well, sending information through the internet and getting the information back from the internet, even though in, in people terms, it doesn't take that long. It may take a second or you know, part fractions of a second. In computer terms, that's a long time to send data through the internet, find the web server, and have the data come back. That's a long time compared to how quickly a machine can execute the instructions that have already been loaded. So by making this as part of the web page and doing it in JavaScript, we save the amount of time sent to, the, uh, to, to send the data to the server and get it back. So that's a win. It's a win from the perspective of the person browsing the page because they get an immediate response. It's a win from the server side because the server side doesn't have to handle all these little tiny requests. You let the client handle some of their own requests. So I'm going to use a button. And a button doesn't send it to the server. A button just is used to trigger JavaScript. 
And I'm going to put on here an on click event. Now, it's true that I may have more than one server, or more than one spoiler on this page. So therefore, I have a class of spoilers. But I probably only want to show them one at a time. So I probably will also create an ID. Something can have a class and ID. So I'm going to give this an ID of 1. Because later on, when I have 10 spoilers on this page, maybe some of them are about the old movies that people want to click on, but maybe some of the spoilers are about the new movies that they haven't seen yet. You might not want to click on those right away. So I'm going to give it an ID so that we can show this specific spoiler. I'm going to make the value of this button show spoiler. And then I have an on click event. All right. HTML events start with the word on. So on click, on mouse over, on mouse out, on key down, on key up. All these things are different events that you can put on HTML elements that designate that when the user does that thing, you want a certain action to happen. Any of you that use Twitter, for example, as you're typing in, it shows you a countdown of how many characters you have left. So you start out with 140 characters. As you're typing, as, as, you, as you've used 10 characters, it will show you have 130 left. And then one more, 129. And, you backspace over something, you're back to 130, and so on. So it, it provides a counter, and it's based on as you're typing the keys. All right? Certain games that you play all right, that are written in JavaScript, as you press the keys, as you press the arrow keys, for example, it will cause something to happen. Here we're clicking the button. And what do we want to do when we click the button? We want to show the thing that has an ID of spoiler one. What does that mean to show it? We want to set the display to block. Right? If you remember from the um, image example before, we set it, the display to none. Um, when we hid the thing, when we wanted to show it, we set the display to either inline or block. Well, in this case, it's a paragraph, it's a block tag, so I want to set the display to block. All right, but well, first we have to point to it. Now, there's a bunch of ways that you can point to an element of, on your page, but the easiest way is to use the ID, right? If you think about it, that makes sense. Um, I could, for example, point to students in the class using their first name. Today I could get away with that, right? Because everyone only, you know, there's only everyone in here has their own first name. But if you can imagine I had a big class, there's liable to be two people named John, two people named Mike, or whatever. So if I tried to use the first name as a way to point to people, that wouldn't be a good idea. What would be a good idea would be to use the student number. Student with the student number one, two, three, four, five, six. I need to talk to you. All right. If I do that, I'm only referring to one student. There's no ambiguity to say, well, which mic do you mean? This mic or that mic? So in web pages, the way to guarantee that you're going to point to just one thing on the page, because re remember, what we want to do is we want to show this one spoiler. The way to guarantee that is to use the ID. So I want to point to the thing that has this for the ID. And the syntax for that is document get element by ID. And then in quotes, single quotes, you put in the value of the ID.
All right, so let's look at this. Let's break this down a step at a time. The word document. The word document means it's somewhere on this web page. All right? Which is a pretty safe assumption. But it is possible to write JavaScript to access stuff on other windows, especially other windows that you have opened. So you could pop up a window, a pop-up ad, and, and manipulate the data in it. So document simply means it's on this web page. OK, fine. Get element by ID is what's called a function. And it finds the thing on the page that has the ID that's included in parentheses. And in this case, we want the thing that has an ID of spoiler 1. Now, here's one thing that gets to be very maddening about JavaScript, is that it's case sensitive. So in other words, document needs to be a lowercase d. Get element by ID needs to be upper and lowercase as it's shown here. The g in get is lowercase, the e in element, the b in by, and the i in ID are all uppercase. So the first word is lowercase. Each subsequent word starts uppercase. We have parentheses. Inside the parentheses, we say the ID that we want. So we want, we want to find a thing on the page that has an ID of spoiler 1. Notice that that is in single quotes. We have two kinds of quotes that we can deal with, double quotes and single quotes. In this case, the double quotes are going to go all the way around the JavaScript instruction. The single quotes are going to be used inside the JavaScript instruction. Now, this part of the statement allows us to look at this thing, to point to this particular HTML element, that paragraph. Now, what do we want to do to it? We want to change something about it. What do we want to change something about it? We want to change its style. What about the style? We want to change the display from none to block. So I'm going to say, find a thing on the page that has the ID of spoiler1, change its style, change the display property of its style, and change it to block. I'm going to make it smaller so we can see the whole instruction here. On click equals, I have quotes going around the whole instruction. Any quotes I need inside of it, I'm going to use single quotes, though. Document, get element by ID, spoiler 1, style, display, block. We're zeroing in on the specific thing on the page that we want to change. The first part, first part, document, says, OK, there's something on this page we want to change. What on the page do we want to change? I want to change the thing on the page that has an ID of spoiler 1. That's this guy down here. What about it do I want to change? I want to change the style of it. What about the style it do I want to change? I want to change the display property of it. What do I want to display it, change it to? Well, initially, it starts off as none. I want to change the display to be black. And then I close the tag. And we should be good to go. Let's make sure that this works. Yep. I don't have a value on the button. Oh, I do, but I forgot the equal sign. Value equals show spoiler. So now I click that, and boom, the spoiler appears.
So this shows you how the three things of the web page all work together to make this work. All right. What are the three things on the page? The HTML, which provides the content. So all the content on the page, the button, the paragraph, the spoiler text, all that's in the HTML. The CSS display, uh, describes how the page is going to look initially. Initially, anything that we have given a class of spoiler to, we are going to set the display of none. So any of these things are, that have an ID of spoiler, we set to be invisible. The JavaScript allows us to dynamically change that. And we dynamically change that by pointing to the thing on the page using the ID, changing the style, and changing the display property of the style from none to black. Questions about this? Let's go and add a second one. Okay, so what all you have to do to make this work? We have our statement, we have our button, we have our spoiler. Probably want to change that to say show spoiler to. On click document get element by ID spoiler one style equals display or display equals block do I want to change spoiler one well both these have an ID of spoiler one that's not allowable so I would need to make this spoiler two so therefore this should say spoiler two And then we have that. We have that. JavaScript is very unforgiving. Um, HTML, you can use, you can create tags that are capital or lowercase, and it will work. With JavaScript, you need to follow the case correctly. So for example, if I make the D in document uppercase here, it's going to give me an error. It's not going to give me an error immediately. It will give me an error when I go and click that button and try to invoke that statement. Let's go and save this. Let's go and hit refresh. I click that. And notice I, it isn't obvious I have an error. It just doesn't work. Whenever you have an error like this, it's best to have a systematic way to look at it and to try to debug it. I say in all my classes, the least effective way of debugging is just staring at your code. It's 
it's better to have some systematic way to go and look at your code and see what's going on. And you get clues in debugging, all right? Now, the clues are not always obvious. But it's better to go in looking at the clues than ignoring the clues. How do you access the error messages? Well, it depends on the browser. Within the Google Chrome browser, if you click on this and click More Tools, Developer Tools, you will see a console. And that shows you sort of what's going on wrong. Y you know, you kind of hope that it would say, hey, you, you made the D capital, all right? But it doesn't come out bluntly and tell you that. It says document get element by ID is not a function. But wait a minute, document dot element by I get element by ID is a function. Well, it is if you spell it right. And at least it tells you that the problem is something with this. So you could go and look up, Google it, look in your notes, whatever, and realize that it's a lowercase d. And you can make that correction, and then it will work again. And there you don't get the error. The other thing is if you can't find the ID that you're looking for, if I accidentally put spoiler 11 for the ID. It'll say it can't read the property style of null. What that's telling you is there's no such thing in line 16 of a thing on the page that has an, uh, an ID of spoiler 11. All right, there's only spoiler 1 and 2. How could we make a button to hide the spoiler again? What would that look like? Let's say I want to make a button to hide the spoiler. And we want to do it when we click on the button. What would the difference be between this and the show spoiler? Is this part going to be the same? Yeah because we're doing something to the same spoiler. We're doing something to the spoiler one. The difference is, is that we're going to be showing it, not hiding it. Will this part be the same? Yeah, we're doing something to the style of it. Is this part going to be the same? Yeah, we're doing something to the display. Will this part be the same? No. And what would we change it to? None. And if you're going to do that for spoiler two, we'd just change where it says spoiler one to spoiler two, and we should be in business.
Show spoiler one. Hide spoiler one. Any of you guys remember the old game show, Name That Tune? Probably not because it was probably, yeah, only, only the older among us. Yeah. What was that? Oh, I, I don't know. Uh, it is where you, uh, you know, people say I can name the tune in five notes. And then someone says, I can name it in four notes. And then they play the first four. Whoever like, bids the lowest, they play that many notes. And if they guess, you win and all that. Well, we're going to try something different. We're going to try code that button or something like that. I don't know. I haven't thought of a good name for this. I have two buttons, one to show and one to hide. All right. Could we do this with only one button? Let's describe how it would work with only one button. With only one button, we could make it so that if it was hidden, it would show it. And if it was shown, we could hide it. It's like, sometimes they call that a toggle button. All right? Whereas if it's shown, it'll hide it. If it's hidden, it will show it. Any thoughts on how to do that? Well, we could do it, but it's going to take a couple instructions. Because what's our logic going to be? All right, Our logic is going to be this. And I don't expect you to know this because we've only covered some very simple JavaScript instructions. But we can, we can sort of talk through what we want to do, and then we can learn the JavaScript instructions to do that. So what we want to do is when they press this button, we want to look to see if the spoiler is hidden or not. If the spoiler is hidden, we want to show it. If the spoiler is shown, we want to hide it. So we want to do one of two different things. Sometimes show it, sometimes hide it. Based on what? Well, based on if it's already shown or hidden. All right? So we're going to have a few instructions here. Now, when you have a few instructions here, it's best to call what is called a function. I could put all these instructions as part of the on-click event. But that would get very, very, very difficult to read. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to create some functions that I'm going to give them a name. And the name is going to be show or hide. And I have two parentheses after it that we're not going to use immediately, but we will use in a, in a minute or so here. Whenever you have a function, you have things that are called arguments. And you can actually send arguments to the function. All right. Where do functions live? They live in the head section. And they live in what are called script tags. Script tags are like style tags, right? What do style tags tell us? Style tags tell us we're not in HTML land anymore. We're in CSS land. All right. So. Therefore, don't treat this like HTML. Treat it like JavaScript. How do you make a function? You say the word function. Show or hide. Then you use these braces or curly brackets to show the group of statements that belong in that function. We're always going to use those braces to group instructions together into either big groups of instructions or little groups of instructions. And it's important for those groups to match up. So like for every left brace you have, you better have a right brace. 
Because if you don't, the browser is going to get confused and it's not going to work. So all a function is, is a group of statements that we're going to group together and give them one name. So instead of having to say do statement 1, do statement 2, do statement 3, do statement 4, we're going to say do this function. And that function will contain statements 1, 2, 3, and 4. So we'll just make it easier um, to call a group of, of statements. Eventually, this is going to be good because we're going to be able to reuse this code um, so that we could add a whole bunch of spoilers on our page and they all will work the same way. But first things first. So, the first thing I have to do is I have to tell if it's already hidden or not. And then I have two paths after that. There's a fork in the road. If it's already hidden, then I want to show it. If it's, if it's not already hidden, then I want to hide it. So where you have a fork in the road, where you have two alternatives, where sometimes you do A, sometimes you do B, that's an if statement in programming. So I can say if document dot get element by ID spoiler one style display equals none That means it's hidden. And therefore, what do I want to do? I want to show it. Otherwise, if it's not equal to none, then it's not hidden, so I want to hide it. So this is the structure of an if statement. We have an if. Inside the parentheses, we have a statement that is either true or false. There's never three options in an if statement. It's always yes or no, true or false. Notice that we are using a double equal sign here. That's a little confusing at first. Just realize that a double equal sign is used to say, perform a comparison. Compare these two things and tell me if they're equal or not. With a double equal sign, you're either going to get a true or a false. True says, yes, they are equal. The display property of this thing, spoiler one, is hidden, is no, is none rather. Therefore, it is hidden. If that's the case, then this if statement will be true and you do these statements. Otherwise, you do the else part of it. Now, what do we want to do? If it's hidden, we want to show it. So we can set the display equal to block. Notice that there's only one equal sign here where there's two equal signs there. The equal performs two different um, things, two different operations. It can be used to compare two things or it can be used to assign things. The single equal sign is used to assign things. In other words, we're making the display property in the style of spoiler one, we're making it block. Here we're asking the question, is it equal to none? And that's a yes or no question. Now, sometimes when you write code, it can be a little confusing, especially when you're first learning the programming language. So you can put notes right inside your code. 
You could do that in HTML, but it's, it's somehow a little less necessary in HTML. Whereas when you write JavaScript, oftentimes it is useful to put notes in your code. These notes are called comments. And you can put comments in by using slash slash in front of anything that you put on the line. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to explain what my code is doing. I'm going to say check to see if spoiler is hidden. That's what this statement does. It looks to see is the spoiler hidden. The answer that I'm going to get back, as with all if statements, is either going to be a yes or a no, a true or a false. If it is hidden, then this is true, and we're going to do that. If it's not hidden, then this is not true, and therefore we're going to do that. So my comment here is, spoiler hi, is hidden, therefore show it. All right, now let's see if this works. Show hide spoiler one. Click on this. It does, oh. I'm going to change the code a little bit to say if it's, instead of saying it equals uh, none, I'm going to say if it's not equal to block. Let me look at this, see what's going on. Yeah, I changed the syntax a little bit to say not equal to block. So if it's not equal to block, it means it's hidden, so I show it. Otherwise, I hide it. So this will show it if it's hidden and hide it if it's shown. What's well, something small we could do to the button? Right now the button says show hide spoiler. Well, we could make it to say hide if it's shown, and we could make it to say show if it's hidden. Right? Remember that we can change anything about the page. Because all these things, whether they be in the CSS section, or in the HTML section, they're all properties of the page. Therefore, we can change them through our JavaScript code. We give the page properties, both CSS and HTML, when we initially code it. But then through our JavaScript, we can go in and alter those. So, to be able to do that, I have to point to the button. So the button needs an ID.
I'm going to do this, make sure that it works, and we'll come back and look at it closer. Okay, our button says show or hide. I click on it, it shows the spoiler, and it gives me hide. I click on hide, it hides the spoiler, and it gives me show. So it works just like we would want it to. So let's look at the code, what I did. Because this is a function, I can have a whole set of instructions. That's one of the advantages of having a function. So I can have code in here not just to show and hide the spoiler, but I could have code in here to change the text on the button. So I click this button, it calls the function show or hide. That function first looks to see if the spoiler is not being shown. If it's not being shown, then it's going to show it. How does it show it? It sets the style display property as block. Why style display? Because display is a property of the, spot of the style. It also sets the value of the button. What is the value of the button? The value of the button is the text that appears on the button. Therefore, I point to the button, document get element by ID, button one. That points to this button. I then have dot value. Notice how I do not have style value. Why? Because the value isn't defined up in the CSS code. The value is defined in the HTML code. So it's an HTML property, not a CSS property. So if a property is defined on the CSS, you set it by saying style and the name of the property. If the, if the um, property is not set as part of the um, CSS, if it's part of the HTML instead, then you don't say style property, you just say dot property. Now we can change the color of the button, too. I go through a few examples just to sort of show you that you're not limited to what you can change via CSS. You can change whatever makes sense for you. So maybe we make green for go to show the spoiler. Excuse me. And red to hide it. So I'm going to go in here, and I'm going to say background color green. Now in this case, this is a property of the style. So I need to say button one dot style dot and this is a little bit tricky. Notice that the property in CSS is background dash color. When you refer to that property in JavaScript, you will say not background dash color, but you will say background color with no dash and a capital C instead. And I said I'll make it red if the button says hide.
And if the button says show, I'll make it green. And I have some kind of error. Should I stare at the code? No. Show or hide is not defined. Show or hide is defined. Ah, thank you. That's a good lesson. If you make a big enough error in your JavaScript, it will cause your function not to load. All right? So in this case, it told me it did not know what show or hide meant. Well, of course it should know what show or hide meant. I was using that function a minute ago. All right? Therefore, I must have made in something that I've changed a big enough error to blow it up. And the error that I made specifically was I forgot or I deleted the um, quotation mark and semicolon. So now let's go and try this. Oh, and I screwed up here. I have, I don't want the spoiler to be green, I want the button to be green. So again, I could, I could do all sorts of things. I could make the button really big for hide and make it really small for show if I wanted to do that. Um, I did the color just, as, just to do something else to show you that we're, we're not really limited at all to what it is we change about the page. Any attribute that exists on the page, whether it be in CSS or HTML, we can address and we can change it and we can access the value. Now, let's think for a second. I want to I go and do this, and we'll probably have to talk about it a little bit more on Tuesday, because it might be a little bit fuzzy when we're done with this. But um, we'll talk about this, and then we'll talk about some other sorts of things that you can do in uh, JavaScript uh, on Tuesday. But I handled one of the spoilers. But for the other spoiler, I still have the two buttons. How could I fix that? Well, I could fix it this way. I could create a button. This is the wrong way, by the way. So. Could create a button called button two that calls a function show or hide to. And I could copy this code.
call it show or hide two, and just change everywhere where there's a one to a two. I think I did that. There we go, and we're working. So that works. Both the buttons work. Yeah, that's not a good solution to copy and paste and make a copy of the function and just change every one to two. Why is that not a good solution? I mean, it works. Why is that not good? Too long. And why is it too long? It's too long, especially if you think, well, what if I had a third spoiler? What if I had a fourth? What if I had 10 spoilers on this page? It's an awful lot of code. And all this code is doing just about the same thing. There's only a couple things that change between it. What are the things that change? This does its thing on spoiler one and button one. This one does its thing on spoiler two and button two. So really the only difference between those two functions is one deals with one set of things, the other deals with another set of things. Whenever you have a situation like that, you can supply what are called arguments to your function. Arguments are like input values that you can put in, that you can supply. So you can write one function that will work in several different situations. If you think about it in Excel, there's a square root function, right? Is there a square root function for, to give me the square root of the number 100, and a different square root function to give me the square root of 1,000, and a different one to give me the square root of 10,000? Of course not. That would be crazy, right? There's one square root function, and when you call that square root function, you tell it what you want the square root of. All right? So I'm going to do a square root. Square root of what? Boom. I want to show or hide the spoiler, which spoiler, which button. You give it those two parameters, and then it can do its thing. So I'm going to go and I'm going to get rid of spoiler, show hide two. And I'm going to put in an argument for paragraph and button. And the paragraph argument will contain the paragraph that I want to change, that I want to show or hide. And the button argument will contain the button that I want to change. These are like placeholders. And now when I call the function, I have to give the values. So when I call it here, I want to show or hide spoiler one. And the button that I want to hide or change is button one. When 
when I call the other function, calling the same function, I have the same code, but I want to do it to spoiler2 and button2. So paragraph and button are placeholders. Whatever I put in there when I call the function gets put in those placeholders. So if I call this function with spoiler1 and button1, spoiler1 gets put in paragraph, button1 gets put in button. So this statement that says get element by ID paragraph is really saying get element by ID spoiler1 and set its style to display of none or display of block depending on the circumstances. So now, when I run this code, okay. it works, and there's only one function to do it. As a developer, you should be real, real suspicious if you have code that looks almost the same except for a couple little tiny pieces, because usually there's a way to write your function in a more generic way that it will allow you to um, get rid of the duplication. This illustrates an important point in programming. That a program that works is not necessarily a good program. All right? Of course the program needs to work. Right? If it doesn't work, then it's, it's wrong, it's bad. But if a program works, if it's not coded well, it's not necessarily a good program yet. What makes a program good is how easy it is to change. That's what makes a program good. All right? So in a case like this, if I, had to, if I wanted to add a spoiler, all I have to do is this. If I want to add a third spoiler, All I have to do is change, create my spoiler here, call that same function, give it the arguments of spoiler3 and button3. I don't have to change any of the JavaScript code. Just put the extra spoilers in, make sure the IDs are created right, and make sure I call the function with the proper IDs and my new spoiler is automatically taken care of. So when you can do that, when you can make changes to your program without changing a lot of your code, that's what starts making a program good. All right? Not just that it works. You know, think of a program that works as like a C program, you know, a, a grade of a C. A program that's really good is one that works and to go and make changes to it is straightforward. Um, on Tuesday of next week, we will cover more JavaScript. We'll spend a little bit of time reviewing this example to see if you have any questions about it. Take some time to review this. Uh, we'll then look at like how we could adapt this sort of technology or this sort of uh, syntax to do things like show or hide menus. Um, and then we'll do things like image swaps and things like that, um, just to give you a, a sense of the capabilities of what JavaScript can perform on your web page. Do we have any questions? Yes? Yeah, Mr. Zellers, I have a question. Right, so we're going to meet on Tuesday and next Thursday? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, other questions? Will, y yes? Yeah, what's the final going to be about, if I may ask? Well, again, you don't have a final exam, you have a final project. Final project, that Yes, is. that's correct. All right, other questions? All right, we'll see you in lab.